Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Citizenship in the Age of Digital Surveillance. My name is Francis Cody, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and in the Asian Institute at the University of Toronto. I'm also the convener of this series uh, called The Political Life of Information at the Asian Institute. And this is the first event of our series. Uh, it's a series that brings together scholars, activists, artists, and other practitioners to reflect on practices of surveillance, data visualization, population management, um, and identification, news, journalism, and the social aspects of algorithms from a perspective based in Asia, but speaking to a broad audience interested in the political ramifications of media and information technology. And I know that uh, many of you are scattered around the world, but uh, as this event is based at the University of Toronto, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So this is our inaugural event, uh, uh, Citizenship in the Age of Digital Surveillance. It consists of a panel of three experts who will speak about the social and technological dimensions of digital spying and the contested sphere of privacy shaping contemporary activism and journalism in Asia. Spe uh, speakers will focus on counter surveillance. We have uh, speakers from the University of Toronto's own Citizen Lab and how this re research and public outreach has also been engaged by privacy and free speech advocates. And privacy has always been an important component of our public lives uh, as citizens claiming democratic rights. And as feminist scholars have argued, the public-private divide and where it's drawn, how it's maintained, are of profound political significance beyond the question of citizenship. And while it's clear that states and private actors have long used technology for surveillance and control of populations, Foucault's work from the early 70s being an important reference point in this, something appears to be changing in recent years. Edward Snowden's revelations about American domestic spying appeared to many as a turning point in how citizenship was being reorganized. And the development of advanced spyware, about which we'll hear more about today, makes us all think more deeply about the possibility that we're not always in control of when our computer or cell phone cameras are on, recording information that can be used against us. The fact that more and more of our lives are lived online this event included can be worrying. The dangers posed to journalists and activists, those who are most important in asserting the rights of citizens and those who are especially vulnerable to harm through new technologies of surveillance are pressing, especially in the current climate of majoritarian populism. At the same time, in India, where a majoritarian populist government has been especially aggressive against media, a recent Supreme Court ruling asserting that privacy is a fundamental right provides means of reshaping state or corporate incursions into everyday life. Everywhere, the very same technological expertise that are used against citizens can be mobilized to pierce the opacity states depend on in their exercise of coercive power. So in order to understand both the stakes of these contestations um, and uh, what, what people are trying to do about it, we've asked our three speakers today to share some of their research and thoughts on how they see contemporary citizenship and its connection to privacy rights being reformulated as a result of the proliferation of digital technologies of surveillance. And what I'm gonna do is introduce our three speakers right now, um, and then uh, sort of explain the protocol for a question period, and then I'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, so we'll hear first from Scott, uh, sorry, John Scott Railton. John is a senior researcher at the Citizen Lab. He's raising his hand there. His work focuses on technological threats, civil society, including targeted malware operations, cyber militias, and online disinformation. His greatest hits include a collaboration with colleague Bill Marzak that uncovered the systematic use of Pegasus spyware to target civil society in several countries. And we'll be hearing more about that today. Recently, John was a fellow at Google Ideas and Jigsaw at Alphabet. John has undergraduate degrees from the University of Chicago and a master's from the University of Michigan. He's completing a PhD at UCLA. Previously, he founded the Voices Project, collaborative information feeds that bypass internet shutdowns in Libya and Egypt. John's work has been covered widely by Time Magazine, BBC, CNN, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. 
Um, you can see some of his recent publications at the Citizen Lab website, which I encourage you to look at. They include Nothing Sacred, Religious and Secular Voices for Reform in Togo Targeted with NSO Spyware, and Dark Basin, Uncovering a Massive Hack for Hire Operation. So after John, we'll hear from Irene Portranto. Irene is a senior researcher also at the Citizen Lab and a doctoral student in political science at the University of Toronto. Her primary research interest is on cybersecurity policy development in the global south, especially the Asia Pacific region. She obtained a master's degree in political science and Asia Pacific studies from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of British Columbia. You can also find her uh, recent publications at the Citizen Lab website. They include COVID-19 and its impact on marginalized communities in Singapore, South Korea, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and Canada's scattered and uncoordinated cyber foreign policy, a call for clarity. And then our uh, third speaker will be Chinmay Arun. Chinmay is a resident fellow of the Information Society Project at Yale Law School and an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She served on faculties of two of the most highly regarded law schools in India from 2010 onwards and was the founder director of the Center for Communication Governance at the National Law University in Delhi. Chinmay has been a consultant to the Law Commission of India and a member of the Indian government's multi-stakeholder advisory group, the India Internet Governance Forum. Some recent publication include uh, AI in the Global South, Designing for Other Worlds, which is forthcoming in the Oxford Handbook of Ethics of AI, and India's contact tracing app is a bridge too far. It can be found at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so I've asked each of our speakers to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes about their research. Um, and then we will open it up for questions. And the procedure for that is to use the Q&A uh, feature on Zoom itself. If you wanna ask a question, you can ask a question while they're talking and we'll collect questions um, after the talks uh, in order to facilitate a, a, a wider conversation. You can also send it to uh, uh, the email address asian.institute.utoronto.ca. So feel free to ask a question at any point in time and we'll be able to collect some of them as a basis for the, for the discussion after the presentation. Um, so now I'd like to just begin by, uh, by asking uh, Scott, uh, John Scott Railton to share some of his research. Hey, uh, Cody, um, uh, Francis, um, good to uh, see everyone. So um, can everyone hear me? Just I need a nod so I know. Okay, cool. Yeah. What I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. Um, and uh, if there's a glitch with that, uh, hopefully somebody's going to shout at me real quick. Um, so I'm John Scott Relton. All right. Can we all see full screen a presentation that says spyware in strange times? Okay. Um, well, I feel like I don't need to explain why um, uh, times are strange right now. Um, and uh, Francis gave me a very gracious introduction. I'll just briefly mention, so the Citizen Lab is based at the University of Toronto. Um, our work focuses on doing a couple of things that are kind of interesting. We do data-driven, scientific, and peer-reviewed research. Um, and we focus on a couple of different areas. We look at digital threats to civil society, which is what I'll talk about. Uh, we also do work on censorship and information controls. That includes things like tracking, uh, censorship in China. I uh, most recently did some really interesting work um, looking at um, censorship and surveillance in uh, WeChat. So ripped right out of the headlines, um, uh, we looked at the way that um, WeChat for users outside of China um, was used as a surveillance tool. And then we also track uh, some cases of disinformation. Um, and for health and safety reasons, um, we will all be transitioning to um, cyber presentations and cyber crime. So I feel like this topic is uniquely topical. Um, I'm going to start with some thoughts and then I'm going to tell some stories. Um, we're in sort of an interesting problem space right now. As researchers and academics, we're trying to frame norms around international cybersecurity, what's okay and what's not. Even as this is happening, civil society is being constantly and effectively targeted by governments for hacking and suppression, disinformation, and censorship. Here's a graph that I think shows a lot. If you take a look at the targeting portfolio of a nation state hacking group, this happens to be Russia, but it could be anybody, um, what you find is a full third of the targets of these operations 
are within civil society. And yet for the most part, when we read about and hear about digital security stuff, it tends to be either stories about breaches or bad things happening to governments. Interestingly, although states exercise a fair amount of restraint when they target each other digitally, right, perhaps they're concerned about repercussions, they show extremely little restraint when they target civil society. This conversation is going to be focused on talking about a driver for the proliferation of these capabilities, and that is a particular global marketplace for spyware. And I have um, borrowed the pitch of NSO Group, one such company. The pitch that's being made to governments around the world is, look, terrorists and criminals are going dark. They're using encryption and other digital technologies, and you can't, file, find, you can't follow them uh, down the hole to Hades. So you need to find a way to get around all the ways that criminals and terrorists protect themselves digitally. And there's kind of an inverse pyramid of ways. At the top level, you have data analytics. So this is like country-scale digital monitoring of populations. Going down a layer, you have the interception of networks, network monitoring, and at the very tip of this thing, you have targeted spyware. And that is the use of spyware and intrusion technology to target the phones or the computers of a group of people. And probably at some point your air purifiers and nest thermostats, but um, hopefully that particular hell will take a few more years to arrive. Um, the way that this uh, works is that there are global conferences and events where you can go and buy this kind of technology with a whole bunch of companies selling their wares, including my absolute favorite tagline for Ability, which has actually had some trouble uh, in recent years, but their tagline was, well, others talk, we listen. A creepy double entendre if I ever heard one. Um, and you can buy stuff like this. This is a cell phone interception uh, equipment in a uh, cute little um, fake van. So it used to be the case that if you wanted to spy on your population or do large scale surveillance, you needed to have a massive STEM sector. Um, it needed to be the case that you had people who could do math, who could break encryption, um, and who could build out these kinds of technologies. Today, all you need is a checkbook. And it turns out that the pricing is reasonable. Um, you know, for between one and $5 million, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, you can buy spyware that will allow you to uh, remotely infiltrate and monitor any old uh, iPhone or Android. Um, for less than a million dollars, you can intercept and break the encryption of Wi-Fi. You can monitor cell phones. The point is you can kind of do whatever you want. Well, let's talk about the targeted spyware portion of this for a second. One of the most talked about companies in recent years, in part because of the work that research groups, including Citizen Lab, have done is NSO Group, although they go by a bunch of other um, names and aliases, depending on where they're operating. And NSO Group sells targeted surveillance spyware, and they have a pitch. We only sell to governments, we follow Israeli and local laws, and our software is strictly controlled to investigate only criminals and terrorists. And the way that they represent it is their technology can turn on a phone's microphone, monitor the emails, anything that you can do on your phone, and some things that you can't, they can do too. And I'm just going to modify this illustration a little bit to include the kinds of victims that we looked at rather than uh, terrorists. And what you look like to the system is a dot moving around on a map with a lot of behaviors and connections, who you're talking to, who you're associating with. Um, at this point, practically what you're thinking about. And when Citizen Lab and others have done big scale scanning to look for the locations of infections, we find that wherever you look, there are infected devices. This paints a picture of um, an impossibly tempting piece of technology for a growing list of security services. And unfortunately, one of the things that we find is that when security services get those technologies, unless they have extremely robust mechanisms for oversight and uh, accountability, there's a tendency for these technologies to be abused. So in Mexico, for example, um, which has an extensive um, history of abusing surveillance technology, like more than 25 people from journalists to uh, lawyers working in the public interest to public health campaigners against sugar sweetened beverages to uh, the president of the Senate to anti corruption organizations to investigators um, investigating the disappearances of students were all targeted by Mexico's governmental um, Pegasus operator, not terrorists, certainly not criminals, and yet, of course, of interest to um, a state that wants to monitor its political opponents. Um, here is the map. This is a different piece of spyware. Um, what this shows is what happens when a state that doesn't have its oversight but has an insatiable appetite for monitoring its opponents gets this technology. 
Here's Ethiopia, which got it ha its hands on um, a piece of uh, spyware made by Cyberbit, which is owned by Elbit Systems, a defense contractor. And as soon as Ethiopia got it, they began hacking, but they didn't limit themselves to people within their borders. They immediately began targeting wherever they could find their dissidents, from the United States to Canada to India to Japan. And this illustration is compelling, both because I made it, but also um, because what it shows is that distance, geographic distance between yourself and an authoritarian regime used to be a way to get a degree of protection, right? They'd have to send trench-coated thugs to shuffle around in front of your apartment uh, in London in order to harass you. That's no longer true. This kind of technology allows authoritarian and autocratic states to compress the distance between themselves and their opponents and bring harm wherever they go. Here is um, the Saudi operator, similar idea. This shows where the Saudi operator, uh, in this case of Pegasus, um, was targeting. And of course, there's Canada. Um, so what's this all about? Well, meet Omar Abdulaziz, a uh, Saudi origin Canadian permanent resident uh, living in Quebec, uh, who has been an extremely effective YouTube critic of the Saudi regime and a very strong voice for democracy. Here's this handsome guy. Uh, now, a couple of years ago, Omar ordered some protein powder. Um, and place this order online. And shortly after he places the order, he gets a text message. This is his actual phone, this is the actual text message. And what the message offers is information about the shipment that he's just triggered, right? He ordered this protein powder, he's gonna get this shipment. Um, but what's that link? Well, as it turns out, Omar clicked on that link. And the link resulted in the infection of his phone with NSO's Pegasus spyware on behalf of the Saudi operator. And we as researchers, my colleague Bill Marzak and Ron Diebert especially, found Omar because we saw his device, his infected device, beaconing between his university and his home, back and forth. And we actually went to this part of Quebec and eventually found Omar and found these messages on his device. But the story doesn't end there. Omar believes that he was targeted because he was in close contact with Jamal Khashoggi. And in fact, his communications, he believes, with Jamal may have been used as part of the dossier by the Saudi government for deciding to kill Jamal. Let's talk briefly about some attacks against WhatsApp users. So in 2019, um, WhatsApp announced that about 1,400 of its users were targeted by spyware. And the targeting happened through missed video calls using NSO's spyware. And the result was dozens of infections around the world. And ultimately, we determined a lot more than that. One of the infections, interestingly enough, was a UK lawyer who was representing victims of NSO spyware in lawsuits against NSO. And he got these missed messages, which we determined were Pegasus infection attempts. Ultimately, after we investigated the case, we determined that at least 100 journalists, and dissidents, and opposition figures had been targeted across WhatsApp. So all it took to turn a phone into a silent spy in the pocket of the victims was a missed video call. Didn't even have to answer it. And it turned out that there were uh, victims and targets all over the place, from uh, the Rwandan diaspora, dissidents critical of the regime, to um, the uh, Catalan um, speaker, uh, the Senate, um, to a wide array of other individuals, including uh, some in India. So notably, among the target sets, one of the largest sets of targets that we found when we looked into this case were Indian dissidents and Indian academics and lawyers and journalists and others who had been critical of the government. And one of the things that was so interesting to us about the Indian case, which uh, we made public last year, was the extent to which the targets in the case were working on behalf of issues of minorities and were otherwise viewed as critical of the nationalist um, policies of the Indian government. Now, interestingly enough, after this case became public, uh, the Indian government attempted to flip the script and um, asked WhatsApp to explain the privacy breach, which is a remarkable bit of, um, uh, we could say sort of uh, maybe like political jujitsu 
Um, but, and we can talk about this a bit in questions, one of the things that it highlighted is the complicated interplay going on right now between companies like WhatsApp and governments like India who are attempting to compel them to provide a lot more information about their users. And there seems to be a dynamic where on the one hand, states are proceeding with a very public track of trying to pressure and persuade companies into serving up user data. And at the same time, they're not waiting for it. They're busy hacking users. Well, this was going on, a bunch of folks, including some of the same individuals who are targeted with Pegasus, began receiving emails. And the emails look like things like summons and indictments for them or for their legal clients. And it turned out, based on an investigation that we did in collaboration with Amnesty International, that these people, including some of the same ones who were targeted with Pegasus, were also being targeted across their emails with another piece of spyware. And it suggested that there is a sort of comprehensive, all part of this complete spying breakfast, set of threats against um, Indian civil society. So uh, because we are short on time, as much as I'd like to think a lot more about this, I'm going to do two quick closing thoughts. First, the marketplace for the surveillance technology is geopolitical. Now, obviously, it's global. I've already made that point. But what I mean by that is that the sale of this technology is treated as a weapon by most of the exporting countries. This means that in order to sell, you need to have the approval of ministries of defense, state departments, et cetera. What that means is that this incredibly desirable carrot is often now part of the diplomatic relationships between states. And so a state will use the fact that they or companies within their jurisdiction have this technology as part of building diplomatic relationships. And often we see at the lab that these sales come in tandem with other diplomatic relationship building. Very interesting phenomenon that we're still observing. Um, this isn't just true for companies out of the West that sell this stuff. We also observe that China is making extremely effective use of its role as a developer, based on targeting its own population, of both targeted surveillance and massive surveillance to build relationships in Southeast Asia and Africa. So wherever you scratch in Africa, there's a good chance that if Chinese companies were involved in the build out of their three or 4G infrastructure, it's also the case that Chinese companies are assisting those states with doing monitoring. Again, ties that bind. And once those things get locked in, they represent long-term intelligence and sharing partnerships. The problem also is that right now there are weak incentives to fix this, fix this problem. Right now, every state, especially the big developed states that are the origins of a lot of this technology and knowledge, like to be able to use these technologies as part of their diplomatic relationship making. That means that their incentives for fixing the problem, for reducing the movement and sale of these things, are extremely weak and limited. And in many cases, states are actively obstructionist when it comes to trying to regulate this. Closing thought too, yes, things are getting worse. In case you hadn't heard that enough in 2020, um, we find that the targeting of civil society groups often increases, of course, unsurprisingly, as pressure goes up on civil society. It's almost certainly the case right now that many civil society organizations are being targeted in the United States and elsewhere as the pressure rises. Unfortunately, as the space for civil society closes, the same thing happens online, both with uh, censorship and legal technology, but also of legal tools, but also, of course, with hacking and targeted surveillance, which is, of course, exactly what's happening in India right now. I like to look at this as the cover of my favorite children's book, um, Where the Sidewalk Ends by Roald Dahl. So the internet profoundly reduced historic asymmetries in access to communication between civil society and government. You didn't need to get into the news or have your own television station in order to push your message. But there are underlying asymmetries of risk and power that haven't changed between civil society and government. And although technology allowed civil society to connect, it hasn't necessarily been able to secure itself because it's incredibly easy to compromise most civil society organizations and individuals. The information is of extreme value to many governments, and the result is an epidemic of breaches, with the predictive result that there is an absolute proliferation of cases of surveillance and monitoring that don't fit familiar categories like cyber war, but are causing a tremendous amount of harm to democracies and to um, civil society in authoritarian states. Uh, and unfortunately, for the moment, most states are treating this as not their problem. With that, I yield back. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, John. 
Um, and now we're going to turn to uh, Irene, who's going to tell us about her research. Great. Thank you, Frank. I will just um, share my screen right now. Are you able to see it? Great. Um, so thank you, Frank, uh, and the Asian Institute, as well as the Monk School of Global Affairs for hosting uh, this event today and, and for inviting me to participate. Uh, as Frank mentioned, I am a colleague of John at the Citizen Lab. I'm a senior researcher there, and I'm also a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Toronto. So I'm, I'm, my presentation will build on uh, John's, uh, except that I will kind of broaden it a bit to talk about digital threats uh, against civil society more broadly. Um, I will first speak about uh, our recent research findings on digital threats against civil society, and I will give an example through across Southeast Asia, because that's where my research predominantly focuses on. I'm Indonesian by birth, and give you some examples of threats posed by state and non-state actors against civil society. So the first report that I want to highlight uh, by the Citizen Lab is our 2014 one called Communities at Risk, uh, Targeted Digital Threats Against Civil Society, in which we found that, as John mentioned, civil society organizations, they face the same threats that private sector and governments do, but unfortunately, they have fewer resources to secure themselves. And our research has found that technical sophistication of attacks, uh, of these attacks are typically low, but the level of social engineering, so that means the effort that it takes to convince you to, to click on a link, for example, so that your device will get infected. These techniques that are employed, uh, they're relatively sophisticated. They can be convincing enough uh, to make you to click on a particular link in order to infect your device. And what we found is that digital attacks against civil society organizations are persistent. They adapt to targets over time and, and across uh, the devices that, you may, that they may use. And then um, Fundamentally, of course, uh, these targeted digital threats are more than just a nuisance, right? They, they undermine uh, civil societies' core communications and missions, and even uh, presenting a major risk to individual safety. The second report that I'd like to highlight, or academic article rather, is called A Tale of Two Cybers by my colleague uh, Leonard Mashmeyer and uh, two U of T professors, Ron Bird and John Lindsay. Um, in which they found that uh, digital threats, as John again already mentioned, targeting civil society are largely underreported. And this is because threat intelligence firms who would uh, conduct documentation or research into these attacks focus on the more profitable victims. So these are businesses and governments who would have the funds to, you know, let's say, uh, pay them to commission a report or, or to, um, I guess, have uh, attacks tar targeting them uh, be well publicized, whereas um, the conversely, um, attacks targeting civil society uh, are then underreported and therefore um, these civil society organizations are then not included in the threat reporting, uh, which then leaves them in the dark in terms of, you know, the nature and, and the scope and scale of attacks uh, targeting them. The third report is a forthcoming paper that I co-authored with two of my colleagues, Charlie Chan and Sienna Anstens, focusing specifically on environmental human rights defenders. And uh, citing a study done by Forum Asia, it found that land and environmental defenders out of all types of human rights defenders are the ones most affected by violence. And the reality is, is today, you know, it's really difficult to separate offline threats with online threats. They are interconnected. So for instance, uh, to, to build on John's example, Right, somebody's device could be targeted or could be compromised online, but then are used to then monitor their activities offline. Or, for instance, online threats can be first delivered online through Twitter or Facebook and then are then uh, perpetrated offline. So the person is then harassed or, or even murdered, obviously, offline. Um, and what we found is that uh, digital attacks are not just launched against the activists themselves, but also against their friends and families and colleagues, creating strains in their personal and professional lives and therefore creating a chilling effect to their activism. And women activists in particular, they face threats assailing their honor and reputation, as well as their supposed gender role. So criticism such as, you know, oh, women belong in the kitchen and not in in activism. So I'd like to bring in uh, COVID-19 here because that's why we're having this event online. Um, I think uh, we are all uh, 
I guess, sadly, perhaps accustomed to um, over the skin surveillance, uh, but except that with COVID-19, this is only going to be even more pervasive, right? We're going to see thermal fever detection cameras, uh, you know, uh, people would be asked to install contact tracing apps and would have to check in using QR codes to go into places, et cetera. But what we're also going to see is that uh, what, what's been called as under the skin surveillance, so things like temperature checks, immunity passports, and so on. And the fear is that digital technologies implemented in, in times of crisis, like in time of COVID-19, is that these tend to remain even after the crisis situation or event is over. So if we look at other similar, well not similar, but other major events such as a World Cup or, or um, the Olympics, for instance, where countries would install CCTV cameras, uh, these cameras or these technologies are implemented in the name of security due, due to these major events that tended to stay uh, beyond the event. So an example uh, would be in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, and in addition, uh, we, we are seeing that these digital technologies are also used to silence COVID-19 related criticism, particularly against the government. And so there is the need to ensure that the post-COVID-19 new normal is not one where a crisis of human rights and rule of law is normalized. So I'll give you a few examples related to this. So there's been um, a number of attacks uh, facing news media and activists in Indonesia in relation to COVID-19. So the first one is uh, a news website called tirto.id. They had their articles deleted, including some that looked into COVID-19 drug development involving the state intelligence agency and the Indonesian military. Uh, the second one is that a social media account of a well-known epidemi epidemiologist who has been critical of the government's COVID-19 related policies. It was also hacked. And the website of a research group uh, known for being critical of the government's COVID-19 policies was also, was also hacked. And as a result, they lost a number of important documents. Uh, now moving on to the Philippines. Um, so uh, during the time of COVID-19 in August 2020, the, the government very quickly passed uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act. And the fear is that the definition of terrorism under this act is very, very broad. And uh, in order to classify you as a terrorist, it would also, they would also take a look at your activities online, seeing, seeing at things that you've posted on various social media websites. And um, as a prelude to, uh, to this act being passed earlier on in June 2020, uh, some users, so these are people who are stu uh, student activists or journalists or lawyers, uh, reported that they had dozens of fake accounts under their names created on Facebook. Now, the fear is that with the Anti-Terrorism Act now passed, is that these uh, fake, face uh, fake Facebook accounts will then use to post content, not by the real people who, who you know, have these names, but by whoever is operating the fake account to then post anti-government messages, uh, which would then facilitate them being labeled as a terrorist and then of course it would facilitate their arrest under the anti-terrorism act and in the philippines and you know, the philippines uh, is a very resource rich country um, there is also there there are also multiple insurgencies going on in the country particularly against the uh moral liberation front in the south and also uh, against uh, uh communist rebels and so again, you know, the definition of terrorism is very broad. You could be an Islamic terrorist or you could be a communist. Um, and in any case, um, it would allow the government to uh, detain you and then um, uh, classify you as, as a terrorist. In uh, Thailand and Malaysia, on the other hand, we've seen uh, digital attacks leveled against civil society uh, so civil society groups and, and activists uh, under the banner of Les de Majeste, uh, which means to you know, insult, insult the king or insult the monarchy. Um, and in Malaysia in particular, so Les de Majeste is in the Thai criminal code, it's section 112, um, but they've also used uh, the Computer Related Crime Act, for example, to also charge people for what they say online. And the crazy thing in Thailand is that if somebody accuses you of Les de Majeste, uh, the charge against you cannot be repeated and therefore you have no idea why were you charged under Les de Majeste. And also uh, the penalties, I believe, is anywhere between three to 15 years per count. So if let's say you send four text messages and they pursue the maximum 
uh, the maximum penalty, which is 15 years, then 15 times four, then you'd be in prison for 60 years. Um, in Malaysia, Mal uh, in contrast, Malaysia also has a monarchy, but it does not have a laissez majesta law. So people who are critical of the government or the king uh, are charged under the Sedition Act, which is a legacy of the British colonial power there in, in um, Malaysia. And cru crucially, in both countries, Malaysia and Thailand, the, the accusation of laissez majeste uh, is typically used, or, or at least has been used, uh, against those who would dare to criticize the government, uh, including in Thailand, uh, which you may have heard about the student protests going on right now, uh, is to uh, abolish the monarchy and, and change Thailand into a demo democracy. And my final example would be from Singapore, where we have seen the anti-fake news law or the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act, uh, POFMA, uh, which uh, has been used, or the fear is that it will also be used against uh, civil society activists, NGOs, and opposition figures. And uh, to this fear, the government said, well, that would be an unfortunate coincidence, right? And um, the fear is that, uh, because we know that governments learn from one another, not just in terms of purchasing surveillance equipment, as John has mentioned, but also they look at what, what laws other countries have passed and then seek to emulate them. So since the passage of Singapore's anti-fake news law, Nigeria and Thailand have already said that they want to emulate. Uh, Malaysia actually came up with the first anti-fake news law, I believe, in Southeast Asia, but then that was delayed, and then Singapore ended up passing it um, earlier before they did, just to show that countries do learn from one another. Um, and the other issue uh, that I'll, I'll bring up uh, briefly is the issue of LGBT rights. So of the 70 countries around the world that criminalize homosexuality, at least 42 of them were once under some kind of British control. In Southeast Asia, these laws exist in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and Myanmar. And Singap in, in Singapore, uh, there is section 377A of the, of the penal code, which criminalizes sex between men. Um, and although the, uh, this uh, law is rarely invoked, uh, but, uh, act, but civil society activists in the country has not been able to have the law repealed for being unconstitutional. It was recently held as constitutional. And, um, and I mention this because the Citizen Lab is currently conducting research on the censorship of LGBT websites around the world uh, to uh, determine its impact on movement building, and we're looking at Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, and, and we find that um, in these countries, especially, like I said, those with um, laws that criminalize homosexuality, uh, the, the fight uh, for equality and LGBT rights have been very challenging. So I'll just... Uh, I'll end my conclusion. So I'll end my presentation by saying that, again, to, to echo what John had already mentioned, that targeted digital threats uh, extend the reach of the state uh, or other threat actors beyond borders and into uh, countries or, or areas that have been known uh, as safe havens. And then finally, that more evidence based research is required to further determine the scope and scale of digital threats while also taking into account unique local contexts, because we know that different communities are targeted differently and that although uh, a great number of civil society activists and groups now face digital threats, of, uh, obviously there is uneven impact in that marginalized communities are more vulnerable to digital threats. So I will end my presentation there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Irene. And now uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Chin Mai. Thank you, Frank and colleagues, for inviting me. And thank you, John and Irene, for the excellent presentations, which I think lay a good foundation for what I'm going to say. Um, and so I'm planning to discuss India with a focus on the privacy law infrastructures that make state surveillance possible and make it possible at a scale that I think is dangerous. Um, and so I thought that to begin with, I would describe to you briefly the background of, um, of how privacy law was evolving in, what I, in, in the past and what changed first with the information age and then with the political changes that John and Frank, you also described that have taken place in India. Um, and so initially there was a, a natural struggle between technology and constitutional law in India. 
Um, surveillance was has always been difficult in a country that size. And so a lot of the books that talk about the empire and surveillance discuss how the British had a very difficult time getting the kind of granular information that they, they wanted to keep uh, to, to control the Indian citizens. It's just because of the size of the country. Um, and it's helpful to think about that as a contrast because that was that was the sort of the ruler government and now what we've got is a is a democratic government that is actually able to conduct surveillance at at a much larger scale as i will describe so in the in the 90s um when telephones hit india of course um the, the first thing the government did with it is start tapping it and there was a case that went up to the supreme court to discuss um, whether phone tapping can take place given given the Indian constitution. Um, it, it's, it's one of the most famous surveillance cases in India. It's called PUCL versus Union of India. And it it applies a constitution to say that the state cannot tap tap phones as it wishes to, and it creates safeguards. And then there's a there's a series of cases that take place after that, through which the constitutional law and privacy evolves almost naturally in response to technology as is healthy in a democracy. The case law isn't always perfect um, and, and there are changes over the years, but there, there was a natural progression if you look at the history of how the case law evolved. And then of course the information revolution took place and um, it, it wasn't just that big data sets were collected in India, it was also that it was a mix of companies that did it. So there were a series that were local Indian companies that were co collecting data and engaging in the, in the um, information economy. And then of course, more prominently, there were a series of foreign platforms um, like WhatsApp, for example, that John mentioned in his presentation that were also collecting and holding data of Indian citizens. And that's relevant because of how the law evolved to, well, I won't say evolved, changed to, to respond to these, these two changes. Um, one was, um, Frank, you discussed in your excellent introduction how law is used to, to pierce opacity of data. So the state did two things. One was that it actively invested in surveillance technology all across India, and some of it was overt. So like, so NatGrid is, is actually a state surveillance system that's designed to collect data for the purposes of surveillance and was apparently created in response to the terror attack in Mumbai that took place in 2009. Um, and then there are other, other activities that are taking place within the state, which is, um, for example, a, a supposedly welfare system. I, I think most people in the world have now heard of India's biometric identification system, Aadhaar, uh, which, which was used for, for distribution of, of food. And so it's, it's, a, it's a basic welfare system, except that the system was made contingent on people holding these identity cards and, and giving their biometric data, which was all held in, in cent centralized systems. It could have been a decentralized system, but this was a cent centralized um, identity system. And I call that also surveillance technology because what it did is it brought a lot of people that were off grid on the grid and made it much easier for the state to track them, to identify them and, and, to, um, and, and to, to access their data at, at a larger scale. Um, ePay systems similarly were doing this, and most recently, the uh, as, as Irene pointed out so astutely, um, after the pandemic has taken place, there have also been efforts to make Ar Arogya Setu, the contact tracing app, um, used as widely as possible. And uh, if you read the piece that uh, Frank uh, Frank mentioned in his introduction, um, uh, that app again is more centralized than necessary and and its data is accessible in ways that were not strictly necessary for the pandemic. Um, and so, so that's really what's beginning to take place in India. But I'm also going to describe to you uh, another feature that I think is indicative of the political climate in India, as well as the manner in which these technology laws are evolving. If you check the Economic Times, you will see that there's a there's a story in it about a research center called Vidhi Global, which uh, was the single research center that was involved in the right to privacy case representing the the Aadhaar authority that triggered the case in the first place. So the right to privacy case went before a much larger bench, but the, the source of the case was the biometric identification system that was facing a challenge on account of privacy in the Supreme Court. And so the head of this research center represented 
the uh, the biometric identification systems uh, authority in in the series of cases. The same thing tank was involved in drafting the legislation that applies to the biometric identity system. Uh, it has recently emerged, this was not widely known before, that they also had a contract with the National Surveillance Agency, NatGrid. Um, and so they, so they were working for this agency. They were work, and it's, it's, a multi, it's, it's been described as a multi-agency intelligence initiative mechanism that combs through several databases, such as travel, banking, and tax. Um, and and they, were, uh, they were hired to discuss the applicability of privacy to its activities. And the details are not widely known because um, all the journalists that have reported this have said that, uh, that the employees signed NDAs and uh, are banned are legally barred from, from discussing in the exact the details um, of their engagement with NatGrid. And this, the same think tank, by the way, was, um, was the, uh, were really the only legal experts involved with the drafting of the data protection bill in India. Um, and so, it, so it's interesting because um, the, the way law used to evolve before was there were multiple, in, there were multiple ministries engaged in the creation of Law and, the law and governance for these systems. And then the litigation also took place across multiple initiatives. Um, and this is almost a consolidation of how the state is engaging in surveillance data protection. And in part with, with industry in the context of data collection, in, in, a, in, a, in almost a state and industry combined system that, that excludes civil society entirely. Um, if you, if you wish to think about it, there's also contrast between, there, there was an early committee in India called the Justice Shah Committee that was multi-stakeholder and contained, um, it, it had a wide range of people, including people that were privacy activists and scholars and were quite credible in terms of building in privacy safeguards. If, if you look at the Data Protection Committee that came up with the Indian Data Protection Act that is um, supposed to be passed soon, you will see that that was largely a government and industry committee. And the few external experts that were present in it were people like the head of this think tank that was also advising the government on all of its surveillance initiatives. And so that's really the way in which technology policy has been shaped in India. And so unsurprisingly, what we've got on our hands is um, a privacy legislation that has huge, uh, huge exceptions for, uh, for state surveillance and for exempting state agencies that, that need to conduct surveillance. And I think that it's important to bear in mind the things that John and Irene said about what is happening with activists in India when you think about state surveillance, because these legislations effectively use law to, to enable this kind of surveillance. Um, and then the second thing that's happening at a policy level is that the state is not only building its own infrastructure, direct surveillance and welfare in infrastructure to gather citizens' data, it is also asserting this idea that it calls data sovereignty over the data that's being held by private operators. And so there's also a move to start accessing the data held by private companies, both Indian, as well as um, companies like Facebook and WhatsApp that operate in India. Um, and it, it's interesting because US law currently doesn't permit a company like WhatsApp to share the content of its communication. Encryption aside, WhatsApp cannot. Uh, but but uh, the Third Communication Act in the U.S. makes it difficult for them to share data unless the Indian government goes through the MLAT system, which is like um, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty system, which which takes quite long. Um, but if that should change, then the Indian government is is laying quite a lot of pressure on these companies, saying that this is our data and we deserve to have access to it, which is an interesting notion of um, of who citizens' data belongs to. And, and the right to privacy. And so I, I want to wrap up over here and say that, that it's interesting that over the last five or six years, the very healthy citizen advocacy that is characteristic of India has largely been ignored in the creation of tech policy. And what we have in almost every committee and every advisory body that has been designing the system, both for technology and for, uh, for the legal infrastructure for collection of data has been populated by the Indian government and the industry. And the way that they seem to think about data is that the state is somehow entitled to it. And, and that is very disturbing in a democracy. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chin Mai, and I'm going to ask um, 
John and Irene to come back on camera and uh, we're going to field some some questions. Um, one that came in, I think, in the, that is really one that we can pose uh, uh, across the panel um, is about the relationship between spyware and the court systems in countries like Canada and the US, especially insofar as it seems like uh, they're involved in, in, in producing a lot of it. I, I had a more specific question I wanted to tag on to that is, is Canada a major exporter of spyware? Um, uh, I wanted to just sort of ask that question. And then the, the sort of follow-up that is that came from uh, the audience member is that um, we're, we're supposed to need warrants to search a home, but what's the legal status of all these infected phones? And then what does that mean when we think about how information crosses borders? Um, and how does jurisdiction work in this scenario? Um, so back to front, I'll address the phones thing for a second. Um, in the majority of cases where these devices are compromised across borders, it is illegal. And it's probably illegal for multiple reasons. Um, it may be a violation of um, you know, things like Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US. Um, it's almost certainly also um, the case that it may violate certain things around intelligence gathering. But the issue is, and unfortunately, Canada has done a terrible job with this, um, countries are not necessarily investigating and fully prosecuting these cases, in part because they exist within a matrix of other diplomatic considerations. And so it's more rare that you see victims defended. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases, it just means that those cases typically don't come from the criminal authorities of country A investigating um, illegal activity by country B. Um, in terms of the question about whether Canada is an exporter, um, I would say Canada has been historically and continues to be an exporter of certain technologies for um, deep packet inspection, um, network monitoring um, that end up getting used for um, surveillance and censorship um, more than uh, targeted hacking. And I just mentioned the company that John was referring to would be NetSweeper Inc. based in Waterloo, Ontario. Okay. Um, another question that was asked is um, if both authoritarian and democratic governments are using these tools against civil society, what hope is there for fair and sensible global regulation of the internet? I guess, is there hope for global regulation of the internet? Does this not create a risk of fragmenting the internet in the future? I would love to answer that, but I wanna know also whether others um, would like to speak to that. My short answer is, I think right now we're in a place where um, there's a commons tragedy and the common pool resource that's the tragedy is security and privacy. Um, there are a lot of overdetermined reasons why um, states are not providing um, good protection for it. And even states who may be using these technologies legally with legal authorization to target, say, criminal groups um, have a strong disincentive um, to expose the use of these technologies for their own reasons. Um, and the result is users invariably suffer. Uh, Chinmayi, do you want to jump in? Yes, I can. It's, I mean, it's a difficult question. Um, and I think that John offers a fair answer to it. I, I think what's unfortunate, and I, you know, geopolitically, politically, it makes perfect sense, is that states have always resisted any kind of global agreement to hold them to a pact in which they are accountable in this manner. Because the trouble with surveillance is really that it's hidden, and so democratic accountability is so hard until one crisis hits the headlines, and then you need a citizenry that is able to to push governments. So if, if I could wave a wand and make something better, then I would create a watertight international agreement that states enforced vis-a-vis um, -vis each other. But I think that that's very difficult given that all states want to do this. Yes, and I, and I think in the absence of this global legal framework, as Chinmay uh, said, uh, the former UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, David Kay, has called for a global moratorium on the sale of these tools. Because unless, as John mentioned, uh, there is accountability in terms of how they're used, then these human rights violations are only going to continue to occur. 
Okay, another question uh, was more specifically for Irene. Uh, does ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, have a state um, digital policy? Um, it, it's of course impossible to ask countries to govern themselves, but could there be a benefit of a multilateral digital governance at a more regional level is a question that's been posed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. And I think for a long time, people have debated, scholars have debated the relevancy of ASEAN. And I think it's even more so um, in the digital age that we live in today. Um, I think the, the problem with doing so in ASEAN and all these regional groupings uh, consisting of emerging economies is that there's a very uh, different level of development, right? So if we look at Southeast Asia, you have Singapore, which is highly uh, which is hyper connected and and which you know like uses all sorts of all sorts of e government and, and digital payments and all these other tools because they're they're small and they're very well developed uh, at the same time in ASEAN you have countries like Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar in which you know the internet penetration rate is very low and therefore to achieve uh, some sort of like a regional agreement on how the internet should be governed not to mention also um, you know the fact that within ASEAN you have more democratic countries as flawed as they are um, so Indonesia and the Philippines and then you also have uh, Cambodia for instance which seems intent to be a client state of China so so to get all these countries agree upon a, some sort of uh, arrangement on, on how the internet should be governed down to, to, to the details of what constitutes as a cyber attack and, and, and you know, uh, sticky concepts like sovereignty. I think it just becomes really difficult to agree at a regional level, uh, just more broadly on how the internet should be governed. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think until there is, um, until it kind of evens out both in terms of not just democratic quality, but also um, internet penetration and, and the use of, um, you know, digital technologies, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to reach an agreement either at a regional level. Okay, I'm getting many versions of the same question, which is what is the best way a populist can combat these intrusions into privacy? I mean, some of it is asked at a more kind of individual level, what can be done in terms of protecting yourself? I mean, we've been thinking at the, sort of the larger governance level. Um, so what's the most effective form of, of combat? That might be a wider question to ask. Um, I I mean, I feel like John's going to have a more detailed answer to this, but I, I do want to say one thing that it's helpful to discuss this at an individual level, but not everybody's in a position to, to tackle it at the individual level, which is why the institutional safeguards are really important. Um, given the state of democracies in the world, I'm not sure what it would take to ensure that the safeguards are put in place. Um, but I think that it's important that we develop them at all the levels possible and that we um, we, we find ways to hold governments accountable. And I, I mean, you know, not just in terms of privacy language. So if you see the Indian Data Protection Act, it's got data protection and privacy written all over it. And then you look at the actual procedural safeguards and they're terrible. There's almost no accountability in that system. Um, and so we, we do need to be careful, not only in terms of legal frameworks, but, but building actual accountability so that it's possible to see what states actually do. Uh, whether it's in, so one of my favorite devices, for example, is that states are required at least ex post to, to reveal the surveillance that they conducted so that there's some space in which they're held accountable, but that's the European Court of Human Rights. Um, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to stop at institutional safeguards. I think that John and Irene might have more to say. So uh, I got a thought, um, and that is that this thing works like a three-legged stool. You need to have, um, government, civil society, and corporate engagement and concern. And for the longest time, the only player that was really registering concern was civil society and academics. More recently, um, in part because of the brashness of uh, companies like NSO, the private sector has weighed in. Uh, some of them have weighed in very publicly and others more discreetly. Publicly, you have WhatsApp, which has sued NSO um, and is currently fighting a very um, dramatic and exciting lawsuit um, with NSO for the breach that happened last year. You also have a number of companies quietly working to block NSO's technology and just not telling anybody about it. The third pillar, right, is government. And for the most part, I think that's really the missing link here, which is governments are not showing themselves to be very serious 
about um, prosecuting these investigations and um, following them down. If the question is, what can the listeners here do, assuming that none of the listeners um, run a government um, or are, you know, uh, you know, run a tech company, I would say one of the single largest things that you can do is to educate yourself about what's going on um, and uh, be a voice for asking these questions, be an informed consumer about these things. If, and I detected that in uh, Francis's original question, people are concerned about their individual cybersecurity. Um, I will give you something that you can take away, uh, which is the Citizen Lab has created a website called the Security Planner, www dot securityplanner.org, which asks you a few basic questions and then spits out expert-driven, personalized cybersecurity advice. It's not going to protect you against NSO, but we're all safer when people, like with herd immunity, take some um, steps to be more secure online. Thanks, Irene. Okay, we also had a question that was more specifically for Chin Mai, which was about the Indian context. Are there any public interest litigations that are questioning the rise of spyware attacks on the citizenry, citizenry et cetera? And then there's a follow-up to that. Also, are projects like NETRA, N-E-T-R-A, and the central monitoring system of the Indian government under court's jurisdiction or open to litigation? I, I'm sorry, I haven't looked those up specifically. There is very healthy litigation in India. And I, um, yeah, but I, do, I don't want to give you a vague answer about this. Um, so if you like, I can look it up and get back to you in a bit. Um, NETRA, uh, sorry, could, could you just repeat the specific question about it? Uh, are projects like NETRA or the central monitoring system uh, of the Indian government under the court's jurisdiction, or are they open to litigation? In theory, they should be because they implicate citizens' right to privacy. But the trouble is that they are taking place in such an opaque space that it would um, it, it would be a challenge to work out how how to mount litigation against them. It, it, this is also the space where I'd, I'd like to mention that the Indian privacy case, as um, as much lauded as it is, uh, does offer a pretty wide gap for state surveillance. Uh, saying that if it's in the legitimate interest of the state and there's a law and it's proportionately conducted towards a legitimate aim, uh, state surveillance is fine. Um, and so it's going to be a challenge first to find the evidence to, to mount a challenge against these systems. And then, you know, after that, to, to demonstrate to the Supreme Court that on, a, on, on balance that they violate citizens' privacy. And I, I say that not as a criticism of the Indian Constitution, but just as a criticism of the manner in which the, the law is being articulated these days without 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 considering the, um, the disproportionate harm that's occurring thanks to state surveillance thanks uh, i had a question which was um it, it arose during john's presentation but it's it's one that i think and either of our citizen labbers could uh, address and that has to do with how does a uh, large-scale scanning happen? I mean, how does, how, how does one actually go about finding uh, spyware in use? Uh, I mean, you know, without getting too much uh, into the technical weeds of it, but uh, maybe it, if you could describe how that just for the, for the layperson. Sure. Um, so there are lots of different ways, but think about it like this. If your device is infected, it's infected in order to get information out. Mm -hmm. Well, that information has to go somewhere. And so a big part of the work that we do at the lab is to find those somewheres and then look for commonalities. So look for servers on the internet that are designed to receive information from infected devices or look for servers that are used as part of the chain of events that causes the infection of device. Or we may look for the presence of infected devices on networks. We have different ways of doing that depending on the problem set. There's a constant arms race though going on between us and the companies that make spyware in order to hide in some cases from the techniques that um, we use. Um, just as a follow-up, has the Citizen Lab been subject to uh, attacks that you can speak of? Uh, yeah, so um, a Citizen Lab researcher was targeted um, as part of a UAE-based uh, campaign um, known now as Project Raven, 
um, several years ago. And then um, myself and my colleague, Bahar Abdurazak, were targeted in person um, by uh, private spies working, we believe, um, for the firm Black Cube, um, tracking us and attempting to um, get us into meetings. Um, ultimately, we discovered that um, as we did with the hacking attempts um, and uh, humiliated and exposed it publicly, but um, it has happened, yeah. If you'd like to read that story, um, if you Google uh, bumbling spy New York Times, um, you'll find a fun yarn. Uh, are there organizations uh, like the Citizen Lab uh, elsewhere that are doing this kind of work? Um, I'll answer and then maybe somebody else could. Or was... Chinmay, did you have a, an answer there? Uh, okay, so um, there are a bunch. Um, Amnesty International has a team that does these investigations. Um, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, has a team. And then a lot of threat intelligence companies and cybersecurity companies are also investigating these players. Um, their outputs may not highlight the civil society victims and victimology, um, but there are lots of players tracking uh, these groups. One of the challenges though is ensuring that all the players who are tracking it, their outputs um, are known to the public and policymakers so that people understand the scale of the problem. I mean, th that raises a, a question that we've had various versions of it sent to us uh, about the role of technology in, um, in fighting surveillance or counter surveillance. Presumably if there's a market in spyware, there's a market in uh, spyware detection services. Um, and I mean, are there market mechanisms that are at, at play in, um, in uh, producing technology that would help people protect themselves? Sure. I mean, there are antivirus companies um, and yeah. plenty of companies that do cybersecurity. One of the challenges, and we've, we focused this conversation really on targeted malware, so sophisticated yeah. stuff. And a lot of those attacks, um, before they're launched, um, they're tested against common antivirus products. So uh, if you want the more sophisticated forms of defense, you have to be like a government or a, a, a company or somebody who can really pay for this kind of um, resource. Um, I'll, I'll ask another question since there, we're getting fewer coming in now from our listeners. Um, and this is for Chin Mai. Um, I mean, we've had a, a, a BJP government in power in India since uh, 2014. So a lot has changed in the technological scenario since then. But was there a marked shift in government policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the question of surveillance? Or is this something that, that we see across uh, across governments in the sense of, uh, you know, very poor privacy uh, protection. I, I don't want to ignore the role that the previous government played in creating these systems. Um, in fact, I remember somewhat tactlessly asking a minister that, you know, you've, you've set up Aadhaar and you're setting up NatGrid. What if you lose the elections? What do you think is going to happen to yeah. you? Your opponents will have this. Um, I, uh, if I can be slightly flippant, um, I, I also used to say that the trouble is when you take this and give it to a government that's very efficient at, at using it against the opposition, then it reaches a different scale. And so I don't, you know, I don't want to absolve the previous government of its responsibility and getting this rolling. But I do think that at the scale and the manner at which these systems have been deployed now, um, I would like to, I would like to think that the previous government did not plan this. Um, and so to give you an example, the, uh, the Justice Shah Privacy Committee that, that did contain a strong representation from people that care about human rights, that was under the previous government. The Data Protection Committee that was created under this government, it conducted wide consultations, but they weren't transparent. And so it's hard to say which recommendations were picked up and which ones were not. And there, there, was, there was a lot of press critiquing the composition of the committee with suggestions about uh, human rights and like privacy experts that, that would have been acceptable members of the committee. They were not uh, taken into account. It's the same with Aadhaar. Um, I, I looked at the Aadhaar Act and the manner in which it, it changed between um, 
the, the previous government in this one. And so when this think tank took over the Aadhaar Act, the word privacy was used more often in it. Uh, but some of the some of the the most radical safeguards within the within the Aadhaar Act, specifically one that allowed a three member committee to pull the plug on the entire system if something went wrong. It was a it was a political committee it was supposed to contain one member of opposition, one member of the ruling party, and a third member that I forget. They they actually and it, it, that is a pretty radical safeguard if you think about it. That if this system is going wrong, they can they can shut it down. It's an ombudsman fun not not even an ombudsman function. It's greater than that. That was removed. Um, and so there were several changes like this that took place after the change in government. Uh, and I, you know, I could, I could go on about this, but, but a, another that I remember shocked me was when the attorney general argued before the Supreme Court that there is no right to privacy in India, triggering the whole Supreme Court case. But we had years of Supreme Court decisions saying there is a right to privacy in India. Um, and so I, I do think that uh, that while the previous government was prepared to conduct state surveillance and you know its own little violations of privacy it was not at the scale and they and they did attempt to take human rights people with them um you know and, and build in the safeguards and the friction that really keep the democracy healthy okay one of our audience members wants to know um where they can read uh, more about the research methodology employed in figuring out the targeted spyware attacks Citizen Lab's website, uh, citizenlab.ca, has a bunch of our reports. Um, we also do some peer-reviewed academic publications. Um, you'd find those uh, linked through from the website or by searching um, on uh, Google Scholar by author names. Um, I was curious about the role of publicity in the news in kind of changing behavior of people who are using spyware. Um, you know, for, for example, I mean, I, I came to know about Pegasus uh, largely because of the its use in India. Um, and uh, does it, you know, does it cease to be an effective thing when people know about it? I mean, you spoke about the incredible, uh, you called it uh, political jujitsu. I mean, the way in which the government was able to, 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 to use it as a wedge against uh, WhatsApp in their search for, um, for data through WhatsApp. I think that um, public conversations about this are incredibly important. Um, there, of course, is a problem, which is depending on where the public conversation is happening and how it's uh, structured, it doesn't necessarily result in a better informed uh, population. Um, and it does create opportunities for um, bad action like any other um, scandal or crisis. In general, I think it's extremely important for these cases to be known, but the pressure is sufficiently strong um, on the market to keep providing these solutions and the desire is sufficiently large that the behavior will continue. And there's a typical cycle, which is things get exposed, uh, companies um, either take a step back or double down and then change their behavior so that they're harder to find and the cycle continues. I think it's useful to imagine parallels to the arms industry and the movement of small arms. Decades of reporting about warlords and um, those who sell them weapons haven't prevented uh, people from selling warlords guns and warlords from buying them. Irene, are there cases in, uh, in Southeast Asia that you've observed in your research where publicity has been sort of an important political force? Um, no, unfortunately. And, and I think the difficulty is that, you know, because as John mentioned, the incentives are just too great for, for states to use these tools. And yet, um, you know, public attention, it's, you know, has a short span. Right. I, I, we, I remember when we uh, discovered uh, FinFisher servers in Indonesia, uh, FinFisher is another company that, that manufacture commercial spyware. Um, you know, for a time, I think maybe like for a week or two, people were talking about it. Um, it made it made the news. Uh, I'm not sure if it was front page, but, you know, I, I saw some articles about it. But then um, that, it, it died out, you know, and, and I don't think um, 
I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's just the nature of, of public attention or public opinion that is just um, like a goldfish, um, to, to quote <laughs> Chin Mayu from earlier. Um, and, and also, um, and it could also be also because um, maybe there is a lack of understanding still with uh, just the, the prevalence of these tools and what these tools are, are capable of doing. Um, and, and I would also say that it's compounded by the fact that privacy, at least um, in Indonesia, where I'm from, uh, it's still a contentious concept. You know, we are largely a collective culture and therefore this whole notion of individual privacy, I think, uh, you know, I can easily find lawmakers who would push back against that and saying that individual privacy um, matters less compared to national security, right? And as soon as you bring in national security, as John showed the um, promotional material from NSO group, you know, they talk about terrorism, then I think that overtakes uh, the debate. Um, and unless there is sustained uh, public opinion against them, uh, advocacy campaign, litigation, um, then I think it's going to be very difficult uh, to change uh, this mindset. Uh, but I will give an example of one win recently. So um, in Indonesia, there's a region called Papua, which uh, for, for a long time, it's still ongoing now, there's an insurgency, there are separatist movements there. And um, in the midst of protest uh, um, last year, the government shut down the internet. Um, and they say that they had to shut down the internet because they had to stop the proliferation of, you know, violent images, uh, hoaxes and fake news. Um, but then uh, I believe it was earlier this year that a group of civil society activists, including a group called Access Now um, in the U.S., uh, they launched a, a lawsuit against the government saying that, uh, you know, what they did, shutting down the Internet, uh, was uh, illegal or unconstitutional. And therefore, um, that was a win that, that uh, the court uh, made that decision. And so... I guess there is hope, you know, I think with enough attention and with enough effort, uh, transnational effort uh, by uh, civil society groups, not just in the country, but also elsewhere, um, making the case that what the government is doing is illegal, then I think things can change. But again, I think it's a, it's a pretty high bar. Okay, well, I'm afraid uh, we're going to run out of uh, time soon and I wanted to um, take the opportunity to uh, thank our panelists, uh, Chin Mai, Irene, and John. Um, also thank uh, our staff at the Monk School and the Asian Institute, Dasha, Daria, um, for helping us uh, organize this event. Um, it's, uh, it's a conversation that we hope to continue in different formats uh, as part of this series on the political life of, of information. Um, things that are uh, very pressing on us right now uh, as more and more of our life becomes uh, digitalized. Um, and so I, I just wanted to end by uh, thanking everyone and uh, I hope to see you uh, soon online or elsewhere. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Francis, for moderating, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Great questions.